Well, thank you so much for the invitation. I, I thank the Clapton Institute for inviting me. Um, my name is Dr. Paul Saba. I'm a family physician in Montreal, Canada. I've been practicing for a number of years. I have also practiced in the United States as well. The um, reason I'm here today is to share the Canadian experience of euthanasia and assisted suicide. We've had assisted suicide um, that was legalized in, um, in Canada in 2016. Um, over a period of two years, uh, there have been, between 2016 and 2018, there were 7,000 7, euthanasia deaths. When it was first started, they said there would only be a handful. Uh, as you can see, uh, this has continued to, uh, it, it, it's far beyond what anyone had even imagined. I want to uh, start by talking uh, a little bit about um, why euthanasia assisted suicide are not medical treatments. Uh, first of all, and you can see the, 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 the picture there is a picture of the Good Samaritan. Um, yeah, the story is in the Gospel of Luke and it describes how a Samaritan stopped on the roadside to take care of a person who was half dead and uh, uh, did first aid, took him to an inn and continued the treatment. Why is that relevant? Well, why that is relevant is because um, modern day medicine has been based on the Good Samaritan model. Um, it's, um, you know, we've, we've moved to a more secular society, but the groundwork and, the, and really the foundation of modern medicine is to take care of those who can't take care of themselves. And I'll discuss that a little bit further, um, but the beginning of, of, the, of the ethics of medicine was based on the Hippocratic Oath. This dates 2,500 years, which was before Christ, um, where Hippocrates um, set out standards for care because uh, prior to that, um, physicians could be uh, healers as well as killers. If you were able to pay a, a physician enough money, he could kill your, your enemies. So people didn't want to go to a physician because they didn't know whether the physician would kill them or heal them. And that is again happening today with the um, legalization of euthanasia in certain countries. Um, so that the oath was, I will not give a deadly drug to anybody, even if they, they asked for it. That was even if it was voluntary. Uh, nor will I make a suggestion to this effect. So we'll not promote it. Um, the, the, the model that was the Good Samaritan was taught by uh, Jesus and is talked about in the Gospel of St. Luke. And this model was emphasized by Sir William Osler. Why do I mention Sir William Osler? Well, Sir William Osler was at the university where I did medicine. And he was really the father of, of uh, modern medicine, internal medicine. And also he was a really found founder of the modern, mythical, uh, modern medical oath. And he based his, oh, the medical principles on taking care of people even when they couldn't take care of themselves. I want to describe a little bit about um, what uh, euthanasia is. It's a lethal injection um, uh, that is injected into a patient under, based usually under certain conditions. And then assisted suicide is when a physician will prescribe a lethal substance and the patient will take it. Um, why is it not a medical treatment? Well, first of all, uh, as I mentioned, um, it is not part of the, um, it is not part of the, uh, found, it's, it, it, it is not something that a physician uh, is supposed to do. It is part, it's, it's contrary to our, to our ethic. And I will, I'll tell you what happened recently in the World Medical Association because I just came from there. Um, it makes the doctor who's the healer to become the executioner. And the other thing is people will say, and I've often heard the arguments, well, it's just one extra thing we can give people, an extra choice. And I will, I'll explain to you why that extra choice is really not a real choice. And it is not part of palliative care. Um, as a physician, my uh, my oath commitments to care, to cure sometimes, alleviate suffering, always, 
which is was part of palliative care, but not killing. And this is my commitment as a physician. Um, what has happened in, in, in the province of Quebec and in other provinces, um, although physicians are not obligated to euthanize, we're obligated to refer. And a referral is like writing a prescription prescription and knowing that the person will be killed because we're referring them to somebody else who's going to kill them. Um, the Nuremberg principles followed the Second World War and it laid out clearly that referral is equivalent to participating in euthanasia and makes one guilty as one who commits euthanasia. And that's been the foundational of, of the Nuremberg principles after the Second World War because of the uh, horrible things that doctors did after, uh, during the Second World War. Some people falsely believe um, that if you don't sign up for euthanasia assisted suicide, it won't affect you or your families. They say it's voluntary and you have to sign. Well, we have stories where it does affect people because it affects families. And Tom Mortier, uh, some of you may know, um, is a, a professor in Holland, sorry, in, in Belgium, and his mother was euthanized for depression. He was called the day after. Um, he was somebody who didn't bother him. He's, uh, uh, he, he is a, uh, he's, he's described himself to me as an agnostic. I had him speak in Montreal. Uh, he said he never imagined uh, he would have to live to the horrors of having lost his mother and their, the, his children, which are the grandchildren of this woman, all because she was depressed and the doctors uh, decided to euthanize her. In, they weren't able to uh, convince, um, stop her from doing it because they weren't informed of it. Because once a person makes a decision to be euthanized, uh, there's, a, there's, a period, there's a whole idea of, of confidentiality. Um, what's happened in, in Canada, the, first of all, in the province of Quebec, euthanasia was passed in 2014. It was modeled after the Belgian law. And then after the province did, uh, passed it, uh, it was passed in the Canadian Parliament in 2016. Uh, I show this picture of the King of uh, Belgium, that's King Philip. Um, uh, it, what happened in Belgium was they started off with just uh, adults, uh, and, and I'll be showing you later how they've extended it, but they extended it to uh, children in 2014. Prior to them extending, of course, our family, we often have discussions. Um, I feel it's, it's appropriate, of course, in terms that are uh, child appropriate. Um, they're wondering what's happening, and I explain to... Uh, uh, my daughter says, well, um, what can we do to stop euthanasia of, of uh, the children in, uh, in Belgium? And I said, well, honey, you can write a letter. And she was, uh, at that time, um, 2014, she was about four years old. And she, uh, and I, she said, well, Daddy, but I can't write. And I said, well, in that case, we'll do a video. So we did do a video. And at the end of this uh, presentation, if we have time, I'll show you. Why, do, why is that important? Um, and by the way, this is a painting that Jessica did. Uh, one day I asked her, I said, honey, draw a picture of her family trying to get her off the computer uh, because I felt she spent too much time on the computer. Well, she went to the computer and she painted this drawing. And um, uh, she was, um, just a, a very brief story, when she was 20 weeks and 24, we were advised to abort her because of her heart condition and the suspected Downs uh, syndrome. Uh, we refused, um, but anyway, she made this drawing, and I thought the title of Made to Live, and she made Jessica in very large red letters, and I really think that's the message that I want to get across, that each of us, regardless of our age, is made to live and is valuable. Uh, and again, this idea of, of being of value was uh, upheld by the World Medical Association, where I just came back from the conference, that, um, that every human life is valuable. Some people will um, contradict that. I've heard of lots of different things. I don't think uh, we have a little dog, uh, uh, and I value the little dog, and when the dog ate a grape, um, uh, there was a question of, uh, you know, what do we do to save the dog's life? And I was kind of questioning it because of the cost that they presented to me at, at our veterinarian hospital. But my daughter said to me, Daddy, you're fighting against euthanasia for adults, you're going to let our little dog die. So I said, despite the cost, no. Uh, so every, every, every creature is God's creature and is valuable. So I want you to know that. Okay. 
Um, and this is, uh, this is the video that I will show at the end uh, if we have time. Um, what, is, what happened, um, uh, when the law was passed, there was also a, um, uh, a report that was to be submitted uh, in December of 2018. And the report was to study the ex possibility of extending euthanasia to uh, people with mental health problems, to children, and those who have cognitive uh, impairment. And although they did not make any recommendations, uh, they, in the report, they said, uh, in regards to childhood euthanasia, we want to ensure that children are not ignored or excluded. So anyway, in, if I can translate that to you, it means that we need to consider including children. And when I was in school, if we used double negatives, uh, you, you failed in, in, in your writing. But it seems appropriate today for politicians to write like that. Uh, the story of why, how do people, you ask, and I often ask, how uh, can we justify euthanasia of human beings? Well, um, the certain ethicists, and I've often heard people say, well, the ethicists uh, say it's okay. And I say, well, what, is, what are the ethicists? Well, they call them bioethicists. And the bioethicists have a certain um, thinking of what we call the utilitarian model of human life. That means if you're productive and useful to society, you should live. They often will use the terms like quality of life. But if, you're, if you don't have quality, uh, then uh, you're not useful, then you may be better off dead. And this, has, this concept has been explored by Tom Koch, a Canadian bioethicist, and he describes it like the idea of the number of lifeboats on the Titanic. There's only so many lifeboats and only so many resources, and only the strongest who get on the lifeboats should survive. And um, this is contrary to the um, Hippocratic and the Judeo-Christian uh, model, uh, Good Samaritan model uh, of of, of medicine. This is very contrary because the idea of, of, of the Good Samaritan is even the person who was left half dead uh, is worthy to be saved. Um, in, there's, uh, the, the next few slides will talk about what I call marketing death. Um, marketing death is a, a way of making it look good to euthanize your, your, your fellow uh, human being. And terms that are often used are dying with dignity, medical aid in dying. Um, to make it sound uh, okay, you want to you want to co-op doctors. So if the doctor kills you, then it's okay because it's a medical treatment. And I've explained to you it's not. They'll use questions in polling uh, describing: uh, Do you approve euthanasia or assisted suicide if a person is 99 years old and has metastatic cancer and only a few days to live? And you go, well, you know, maybe it's only a, you know, it's a day or two. Of course, this is part of the marketing. And then, you, as I'll show you, it's extended to children and those who are not even dying. They will say, well, the person wants to die. Well, you know, um, even Hi Hipp Hippocrates says, you know, even if the person wants it, you don't, you don't kill them. Uh, and you often hear about people with double suicides. Well, you know, they, they ask to, to be killed. Uh, we don't accept it in our society. I'm sure not in Swedish society. Um, it, if it's legal, it must be okay. So, of course, you want to legalize it. You want to glamorize it. You often see people who are uh, euthanized. They, they don't look like, uh, you know, a, a bag of bones. Because if they look a bag of bones, it's, it doesn't, it, you won't even, you'll turn off the TV. They often show people who are young, who, who look glamorous, and they want to die. Uh, you, there's um, lobbying. Uh, many of politicians are lobbied. They're put pressure on. They say, look at the polls here. Of course, they don't tell them that the questions were, were asked were very biased. And, uh, you know, they didn't say, well, if a person could have alternative care and not suffer, would you be for it? That's never asked in the, in the questions. It's always, if a person has a horrible, agonizing death, would you be for it? Uh, there's a lack of... Uh, a, People say, well, it doesn't concern me because they say I would never sign up for it. But as I explained, Tom Wartz, it affects families and people. They say, they begin it by saying there'll be only a handful. Well, they said that in Canada. They said, remember the health minister said three, four, possibly five a year. Well, in the first year uh, in the province of Quebec, we had uh, uh, over 600. 
and in Canada it's, it's been uh, over 3,500 per year. Extreme language, as I mentioned, um, they'll say, you know, well, if you don't allow the person to, uh, if we don't kill them, they'll kill themselves. Well, you know what, that's not a, a good reason, because we put up, uh, and I don't know if your bridges, uh, but in, in Canada where we have very high bridges, we put up fences. We try to stop people from killing themselves. We don't put them in jail if they don't succeed, because uh, we decriminalize it, but we don't uh, promote it. Um, there's also false certainty of death. They say, well, the person's probably going to die in the next few days or the next few months. Our errors of prognosticating is about 50%. Half the time we're wrong when we say somebody's going to die in the next six months. Uh, also, they say, well, they, we certainly they're going to die. Well, errors of dying are up to 20%. I've had patients who were told they had lung cancer and they didn't. Uh, we can talk about that during the, the discussion. Um, they say if you're not for euthanasia, then you're uh, for suffering. So if they attack the opponents, uh, it's identified as being a progressive idea. And I say that's regressive. This goes back to the days of the Romans when Seneca and, and those people said that it was noble if you're weak uh, or feeble or sick to kill yourself. And uh, that was totally changed with the, uh, uh, with the Judeo-Christian model of the Good Samaritan. Um, we don't have child euthanasia in Canada, but it's being discussed and it's uh, as 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 it, and and being promoted already. Um, and the problem is that uh, children as young as 11 or 12 could be euthanized without parent. And this was recommended by one of the provincial boards. Uh, the case of Nadine explains this because I've heard people say uh, if a child like Nadine goes through multiple chemotherapies and is suffering, because people do suffer, and regardless. Uh, that we can allow them to choose to death. Well, she went through three chemotherapies, she went through multiple, uh, she went to bone marrow transplants, and she survived, and at 20 years, she's in her 20s and is happy to be alive. And the other thing is children makes no sense because they can't make decisions. Uh, I just came back from the World Medical Association in Tbilisi, uh, and they reasserted their commitment against euthanasia because Canadian Medical Association has been pushing for a neutral position by the World Medical, and World Medical said absolutely not, and they reiterated their strong opposition and say it goes against medical ethics and the value of human life. And no physician should be forced to participate, or nor should physician be obliged to make a referral. I'm in, in, in Quebec, I'm for, forced to referral. But, you know, that's not the reason I'm fighting it, because they're forced to referral. I'm fighting this because it's wrong and lots of, of live, valuable lives will be lost who shouldn't be lost. Um, people say, well, you can make it safe. Uh, you can never make ending somebody's life safe. And there is an illusion uh, that if you can convince um, individuals in society except euthanasia and, and, and assisted suicide, you can make safeguards. There's dangers of expansion. Um, we're, we're now talking about uh, doing people with disabilities. Briefly, I just wanted to say we have the example in Belgium and the Netherlands where it's been expanded to people who, who have depression, children, and those who have completed life. I mean, to get to what I want, you, I know you want to hear what's happening in Canada. Um, when the legislation was first announced, it was supposed to be for only a handful of people. Between 2016 and 18, 7,000 deaths. There was a recent uh, court decision to remove the end of life criteria, so you don't have to be dying anymore. To be so, this in two years we've removed the dying criteria. Uh, so people who are ill and handicapped with uh, uh, physical or mental um, problems, even psychiatric, can now be euthanized. There was a case in the um, reported in the in, in the news of, of a patient um, who was chronically depressed without and despite legal proceedings to stop it. The person was euthanized, he was 61 years old. Um, they're now talking of people who can't make decisions, um, and the person who, who was the architect, Madame Yvon, of euthanasia, she admitted that the law started with voluntary only as a first step. So if they're, they're going to talk to you about starting it as a first step, voluntary, and then uh, they're going to remove all of their safeguards that they put into place, but they were never, they were going to keep removing the, moving the goalposts. A mother of a disabled adult daughter uh, refused to have her daughter euthanized despite pressure. Uh, an, an Ontario man was refused home care but offered euthanasia. 
Um, a man in British Columbia chose euthanasia because he couldn't get adequate home, home care. And um, there were 68 organizations who appealed to the Prime Minister of Canada to, to reinstate the dying criteria, and the Prime Minister refused. I wanted to say with Article 10 um, states for disabilities, and this is the United Nations, that every human being has the inherent right to life and shall take all necessary measures to ensure uh, the effective enjoyment of persons with disabilities on equal basis with others. This is not being respected in Canada. There are 22% with disabilities, 5.7% with very severe, in, in, uh, with your population of 10 million, that means 570,000 people with severe disabilities in, as it would be today in Canada if it was similar laws facing euthanasia could be candidates. And the UN uh, Special Envoy uh, said that she was extremely concerned about the um, effect of euthanasia law on people with disabilities in Canada, and this was even before the die criteria was removed. Uh, there was two severely handicapped people who were, felt personally threatened, and they petitioned the Prime Minister of Canada to, to appeal. The Prime Minister said clearly he was not going to remove the uh, end-of-life criteria. What is the solution? Provide people quality care, including palliative care. The problem in Canada, 70% of people do not have palliative care. And just to remind you, palliative care prevents, relieves suffering, and people get good quality care. They have, they're happier and they live longer lives. Um, the classic study in the New England Journal uh, showed that people, even with cancer, live three months longer when they had quality palliative care. So it's not just treating the pain, but giving them support and love and everything else that comes with it, including financial support. Con the conclusion, euthanasia is not the solution for people who are at the end of life, who are facing disabilities or distress. They need to be cared for, not killed. Once you uh, open up the doors and you start with the very few cases that they talk about with people with terminal, it will go expand to people who are depressed and people with disabilities. Real care is medical care and supports. Um, you must exclude euthanasia and assisted suicide as a form of end-of-life care. It is never an option. It becomes a, the only s solution that's offered because they, all the rest doesn't happen and people are encouraged to go that route. Um, so in countries like Canada, I'm fighting and hope to see that that law is dropped and, and reverse. The problem is once a society engages in it, they don't want to admit they made a mistake. It's pretty much like, you know, cigarettes companies were working with the governments, doctors were encouraging it, even though people were dying. Uh, and uh, it took a long time to reverse that because too many people had their hands in the, in the, in the, in the dirt. Um, so what can we do? We're doing what we're doing now. We're speaking to each other, and I know we're going to have a debate later, and I look forward to that. Uh, we need to invite speakers, as you are doing. You can go to our website, coalitionnd.org. You can go also, there's a website on the handout again, which gives the experiences in Canada, and um, that's the Physicians Alliance Against Euthanasia. If you want to contact me, my, my email is also on that, that, that paper. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we have heard a few general things and a few things that are specific to Canada. So you are here as a Norwegian representative of the Nordic Council and one Swedish representative in Parliament. So if you just summarize, how do you experience the discussion in your nation generally on this issue and the legislation and if you have any particular reactions on the lecture? If you begin, Freddie. Yes, uh, sure. Um, yes, my name is Freddy from uh, from Norway. Uh, thank you for, for the invitation. This is a really interesting topic. Um, I'd just like to start by saying in uh, my party, which I represent, uh, there's like mostly been uh, an, um, uh, a thought that uh, euthanasia is uh, not something we want in Norway. Uh, but it's also seen as a question of conscience, uh, so uh, that our representatives uh, quite often have been uh, 
quote, free uh, to vote in Parliament uh, as they want from their like, personal uh, perspectives. But, but I'm against it in most of my parties. Um, and that, I think, uh, also uh, sums up the Norwegian uh, situation, I think. Um, because in Norway, there hasn't really been that much of a push for uh, euthanasia. Um, there hasn't. Uh, there has been, there's only two political parties in Norway among our, well, now it's, oh, now it's uh, ten in Parliament, uh, about so. So only two of the ten parties are pro-euthanasia. So it's the far-right progressive party, and then there's the, the centrist liberal party. Those two are the only ones. Uh, the rest of the parties are uh, either uh, loudly against, or they don't, uh, they don't say that they want it. And then it, that mostly means no, uh, I think. Um, so there, there's some waves from now and then, if there's some particular cases. Um, there's sometimes uh, in the news, uh, people talk about these people that travel from Norway to Switzerland or other places. And this, I think, gives a sort of a small rise in uh, the support for euthanasia, because these faiths are uh, tragic. Uh, but still it sort of blows over, uh, and then uh, it pretty much stands where it has been standing uh, the last uh, well, several years. Yeah. Yeah. And what's your opinion on how do you experience the situation in Sweden? Uh, there's no party that's pushing for, for uh, either, um, you, 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 how would you say? Euthanasia. Euthanasia or uh, assisted suicide uh, right now. I think the, the Green Party had opened up for some um, more... Um, State investigation, uh, yes, I think. Yeah, some uh, investigation, but, not, but they are not really pushing for legislation right now. Mm. Uh, then I think there are some discussions within the parties. Uh, I think there were some discussions now at the moderate uh, um, when they had uh, their um, annual meeting, and there's always when we have our uh, big meeting, the um, Landsdaga. <laughs> uh, uh, there used to be some of the members uh, pushing for for it, but uh, they always used to. They're always been a majority for still. Uh, against mm. uh, but there are I mean I think in many parties there are some people pushing for us but uh, but it's um, but the arguments against are still very strong and uh, I also want to say I'm um, in the um, uh, one positive thing is uh, that I'm sitting in the, I've been in the board for the Swedish church and we had a gathering with um, Science with a doctor who's working with cancer patients uh, with palliative mm. uh, care, and he had a very, very, very good um, uh, speak there and very good uh, facts. And, uh, what, and and there, as, uh, at that moment, we made a statement. There were all the bishops from all the Sweden, from all the uh, all, all Sweden, and uh, all the political uh, groups within the church, and we were all. There was just total agreement that the Swedish Church should stand against um, uh, uh, death. Uh, so so um, uh, I think that was very positive. And also, th we made a statement that even if we, it would be a change in the government, the Swedish Church would still be very critical. So that's uh, put in paper, and, and I think it's very good. If, report from the Swedish church about this. Right. I have many things to criticize the Swedish church for, but this is very good, I think, and I hope they will be strong uh, in this. So, that, so um, uh, that was a good uh, good meeting, and, and I think there was the first time we actually, me and social people from social democrats, we really agreed and said that we must <laughs> stand against yeah. them, because there were the Christian people within all the <coughs> Uh, and when we compare to Canada, I mean, Canada and the Nordic nations, we are pretty similar in, in several ways. Are there any particular things uh, from the experiences from Canada that you thought that we can learn from? I think the, that's also one of the main arguments on, on, my, on my behalf, uh, is that when you first open uh, up for it, 
you have this idea that this is only a very, very handful of people, exactly like you told from the Canadian debate, um, and that you, you put up these, these safeguards against, for instance, minors, uh, uh, people with, uh, with mental illnesses, and so forth. And uh, this has also been like major topics in, in Norway, uh, that we can all know it's okay because all of these things can be solved by putting up safeguards. Uh, but then uh, we can learn from Canada that when you first open up for the principle, then there's always going to be a push, a push in direction, for instance, to minors, uh, like you mentioned, uh, the end of life criteria, mm -hmm. all those things. And that uh, has been a, a main argument on my, on my side as well. So I think um, the lesson from Canada is that when you first open up, then it's a push, and, uh, and that's scary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any takeaways you thought of? Yeah, I also think that's uh, it's very scary how it can open up and how, how people can push for uh, go further. And uh, I also I also connect this of um, this um, uh, the, uh, some others I heard about uh, about this that said that in for example in the Netherlands uh, it could be an argument that you have some ear problems or problem with sight or even uh, psychiatric problems and, and especially when it when you can when it brought us to psychiatric problems that worries me a lot because I worked before I became a politician I worked in, in, uh, with uh, depressed people and I could see how they really really wish to die and uh, I also had a very uh, I was also very in depression when I was a teenager and I know that the thoughts can come that you just want to fly away, you just want to die because it's so heartful and, and it's so... But I have also seen how people can change and how, how we can help them and, and how they can come back to life when they want to live again. And, and to kill people in that, when they are in this mode, it's so, it makes me so scared. And I also read about that, I mean, when you get this... Um, then you know that you have cancer and you will die, of course you can also get a depression. And sometimes I mean, you maybe forget that and you, you don't treat that for the depression. And, and this doctor I listened to that worked with cancer patients, he said that when we treated them for depression, they maybe, they start, and we gave them all the treatment for the pain, they could start to see maybe I should use this last half year to be with my children, my grandchildren, and make the best of it. And, and so some patients that first wanted to die, they changed their view. And if we just kill them in that moment, it's so, it makes me really worried and really sad. You want to add something? Yes, and I think uh, you're into to one of the I think most, most critical points because how can we possibly, uh, in a uh, really, really sure way, say that this is a physical illness and this is yeah. a, psychiatric, a psychiatric issue. Mm -hmm. That, you know, in the real world of, of medical science, that's not easy. Uh, because one thing comes with another mm -hmm. and uh, both affects each other, actually, we know now. Uh, so, I think, uh, because in an ideal world, I think many Norwegians would uh, support uh, uh, anesthesia if it was actually possible to make perfect safeguards. And then you can just, you know, focus on just these handful of people, but that's not possible. And I think just because of that, because uh, physical uh, illnesses and uh, mental illnesses are also connected, mm -hmm. this is sort of a main argument, I think, uh, to, to say we can't do this because it, it's all connected. And I get the impression sometimes that people tend to address these issues differently if you are uh, g general population, if you're a politician, if you're a professional, is that your impression as, as yeah. well? See, I, I think the politicians are put under lots of pressure uh, because they're polls, um, because I've even, you know, been polls to look on certain things, um, and uh, not on this subject, uh, and I probably <laughs> will one of these days, but uh, the, the, the polls are, are financed by groups that are promoting uh, Euthanasia, assisted suicide. So they are able to to uh, make the questions so that people will say yes. You know, if you were to ask me, if there was no alternative but euthanasia to relieve your suffering, would you would you? No, they say would you want medical aid in dying? They don't use the word euthanasia. 
uh, if you were at the end and having a horrible agonist that most of the people say, well, yeah, I'd like to have a doctor helping me. They did a study uh, for the Canadian Medical Association, just to give you an example, and they asked doctors, uh, are you for uh, medical aid in dying? And they said, 60% uh, said no, 40% said yes, but when they asked those doctors who said yes, what did you mean by it? They thought it was palliative care, and it wasn't. And so the Canadian Medical Association went neutral because they had in their mind that they wanted the euthanasia, even though the majority of doctors were probably 70% were opposed. Uh, and then when they went neutral, the, the Canadian Supreme Court uh, said, well, the doctors are neutral. That means they're not against it. So that's why it, it, it passed in Canada. And, um, and then, like you said, what they'll do is they will find a case, uh, somebody in a wheelchair, who wants to go to Switzerland to die. And when you really investigate with that, with the situation, often these people don't have, they're, they're being pushed by the family, they're being pushed by an organization. Our law is actually based on somebody, her name's uh, Lee Carter, who died in Switzerland, and she's had a, a form of arthritis. Uh, she walked into the clinic, but she was concerned, one day I may not be able to walk. And because that one day she may not be able to walk, uh, she took the assisted uh, suicide. So our law was based in case that one day. And my argument has always been, let's give people the support they need. Now, there's going to be a, a, a number of people who are going to, no matter what, you say, they say, I want, I, want, I want death, I want death. I had one patient come in my office the other day, and I was having coffee, I was very happy, enjoying my day, and he walked in, and he said, Dr. Sava, I disagree with you, uh, I, I'm for death. And I said, but I mean, there's nothing wrong with you. Why would you be for death? I'm just for death. And I says, okay, uh, but you know, if you come to me, I'm going to do everything to make sure you don't die. <laughs> I can't guarantee it. And as doctors, we can't guarantee that people will not die. But we need to put everything on their side for life. And if really they're at the end, you know, and we never know because I, uh, I, I, I had a patient who, who uh, came to my office. Uh, just before the summer, he had a cough, he smoked two packs a day, an engineer, 50 years old. And I said, well, let's just do a chest x-ray, just to check, you know, because, uh, you know, I don't, you don't have pneumonia, but I'm not quite sure where you have your cough, could it be a virus, but it's... So we did the chest x-ray, and he didn't have any cold symptoms, uh, and it showed a five centimeter mass. And I said, well, I, I called him back, I said, listen, we have a, a result, I want to talk to you about it, I think we need to do some investigations, and I said, we found something. So what is a doctor? He said, can I see the x-ray? So I hand it to him. He reads it. He says, I've got lung cancer. He says, stop. He tells me, like, stop. I said, stop what? He says, don't tell me what to do. I don't want any treatment. If I have lung cancer, it's my time. I want euthanasia. I disagree with you, Dr. Saturday. No and to make a long story short, he... He did not have, ended, after right? I, I was able to convince him to undergo studies, he had a scan, he had a couple uh, attempts at a biopsy. We found that they had uh, classic Hodgkin's lymphoma, 95% curable. And he called me uh, uh, in the fall, thanked me. He said, it's been cured. I mean, it, you always have to follow it for five years. We never know outcomes. I have many cases like that. People who uh, were told by the other doctors that they had very little time to live. And 10, 12 years later, one lady with lung cancer, uh, severe lung emphysema. She was told by one doctor, you don't have long to live. And uh, she's happy. She said, I would have taken euthanasia if it was available uh, uh, 12 years ago. Uh, she's now seen her grandchildren. I was able to get her to, to, to better care. Life is too valuable. Um, every type of suffering, physical suffering, can be treated with palliative care, despite what people say. That means even going into uh, one more story. Uh, we, we don't have time for that okay. now. Okay. Let's, let's hear what, if we conclude together. I mean, emotions, we all know that emotions are important, but you as politicians, when you, when you meet arguments that are based on, on emotions, we, we would like to help people, and euthanasia would be the best way. How do you treat these kinds of arguments when, when you meet them from the general public? I think it's important uh, also to listen how, who is it that wants uh, that have this emotional argument? Is it the people that really have cancer that are suffering, or is it some arguments from some politicians? And the one interesting study of this uh, Peter Stein, I think he was a cancer doctor, 
He said that when he asked patients and made a study, they said, oh, I don't want to die. I don't want to have assisted suicide. But then maybe someone else wants, so I can, I can be for, maybe someone else wants, so I can, I can uh, argument for, for that, because for someone else's sake. But I don't want it. That was the most common answer, and I think we have to think about that. Who, for, <laughs> who does really uh, ask for this? And uh, I know that there are some people really, really suffering, and, and we have to, have to do as much as we can in science to have pain, uh, to they're not suffering pain and everything. We have to do everything we can for them. But uh, there is a slippery slope <laughs> way to. Uh, so I think. Uh, to, to make this argument, we have to ask who is asking for it and uh, uh, what are the consequences mm. in, in other countries and mm. look at other countries. And how do you handle debates like this? Well, it's, uh, it's, it's really important to, to recognize people's emotions. Uh, if, you, if you don't, then you, uh, then you won't seem to take it seriously. So, so I recognize uh, those like emotional arguments, but I say that there's, <laughs> there's emotional arguments on the other side as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and whose emotions are the most important because there are also strong emotional arguments about people feeling pushed because they feel they're like a burden in their family mm -hmm. um, and they feel uh, a push from society and then there's uh, uh, an inequality in power when there's a really vulnerable individual feeling that push either from society or from family or friends or whatever so they feel like they, they can't contribute etc. Uh, and I say that that are also uh, important sort of emotional uh, arguments. So so we have to recognize that uh, yeah emotions are important, but but they don't go both sides. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now you go back to your ordinary political work in your parties and your, in your nations. What do you think will be the biggest challenges for you as as people or as parties in this question in times to come? Yeah, well, I think one challenge is uh, to uh, the knowledge about this because we also see that in the polls. The young people are more positive young in Sweden, I've seen. Uh, so I think it, uh, to have the knowledge about the consequences and the different sides and, and, and uh, um, that we dare also to talk about it, I think it's quite sensitive not to talk about it because it's, you don't want to lift the... <laughs> yeah. The lid. Yeah. yeah, you don't want to lift the lid, so it's more like, okay, that's just have a status quo. Really. Yeah. But I think there will be more young, more young people that push for it. Mm. So to prevent, I think we also need to, we need some time to talk about it. And what do you think about the common challenge? Uh, well, it's interesting, in my, my youth party there was uh, a big push to, to go for uh, euthanasia. Uh, then there was two resolutions put up against each other. There was one for, one against. Uh, but in this youth party uh, with you know, young people, uh, uh, they said no. Uh, let's let's not uh, go into either one. Mm -hmm. And that in Norwegian politics, at least, that means sort of that you're against uh, okay. when, you, when you're neutral. But that's in practice. Uh, and that I think young people are uh, are at least in my experience have uh, have the, like um, uh, enlightened views on this. Uh, but but I think for, for us the most important thing to take. To, to our debates are to have uh, an informed uh, debate with facts that um, sort of recognize each side because these debates really get polarized and tough and emotional and I think that um, only um, hurts the debate and hurts not only case, uh, the case is how can we best possible care for people who are suffering. Uh, that has to be uh, our goal, and I think it's easier if we sort of take a deep breath uh, and uh, focus on facts. Mm. Yeah. Uh, we will let Freddy go off, he has a reception at the embassy, but uh, we don't have large gifts for you. Oh. Uh, we do have some time for questions and answers afterwards for, for Dr. Saba, but we'd like to thank you very much for taking your time to come in and share this, and bringing back this to, to your mm -hmm. political parties and to your nations as well. So, many thanks for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.